Today, we're talking about the allegations being brought against Sean Diddy Combs, Billie Eilish's comments this week about the media, quote, never saying anything about men's bodies stirring up quite the pot, a high school coach baptizes his players after a practice, and more, all in today's episode of The Insight Hour. Hello there! Happy Saturday. I am aware I wasn't here this week, but you know what? Sometimes you get lazy. But rather than explaining myself any further, Alice, pull up the first story. Singer Cassie has filed a lawsuit against her former boyfriend, Sean Diddy Combs, accusing him of rape, abuse, and sex trafficking over 10 years. Combs denies the allegations. All right, so obviously we don't know all the facts here, but even if some of these allegations are true, then Diddy might have a big problem on his plate. Now, you may or may not know, but there are a few stories in the industry about Diddy's behavior. Let's just say he's got a bit of reputation, but rape and sex trafficking? I mean, that's some pretty next level shit. Now, Cassie said she felt trapped, unable to leave the relationship for a decade, which if true, it's horrible. No one should have to feel trapped like that. But we should probably wait to hear both sides of the story before making judgment. Innocent until proven guilty, you know, all that jazz. I do feel like we're getting better at not jumping straight into cancel, so like that's an improvement. Anyways, Diddy denies it all. His lawyer says Cassie's just out for money. Is that true? I don't know. Sounds like it could get messy in court though. One thing's for sure though, if Diddy's found guilty of doing some of the stuff he's being accused of, I I'm sure more people will be willing to come forward and share their stories as well. Abusing your power and control over someone like that, it's not really the coolest thing to do, to say the least at least. But again, gotta see the evidence. It'll be interesting to see how this all plays out, and it's definitely, probably, most likely gonna get super ugly. Oh, I wonder if we're gonna get into her debt territory again. I do give Cassie credit for speaking out, though. It takes some level of courage to speak against one of the largest names in the music game. Uh, for now, it's a he said, she said thing, but uh, we'll see when the truth comes out in court. I mean, whatever that's gonna look like. Billie Eilish has come out and commented on the challenges faced by women, especially those in the public eye. She spoke about the scrutiny women endure and the double standards in media. All right, so it looks like we've got another celebrity weighing in on the war of the sexes. Billie Eilish called out the media's double standard when it comes to body shaming, saying it's like women are living in a wartime condition. But let's take a step back and look at this whole picture. While Billie's not wrong about the microscope on women's bodies, we can't disregard the fact that the media does greatly affect men as well. Research shows that one third of people struggling with eating disorders are of the male persuasion. As it turns out, men with eating disorders actually have a higher risk of dying than their female counterparts. But I mean, I totally get guy saying fact, not red pilling, just found some facts. Sorry, don't cancel me. Anyways, uh, it's not just about the food either. A and it's not just disorders when it comes to food. The media is populating our heads with unattainable male body ideals too. We're talking perfect chiseled muscles, six pack, full head of hair. Every dude's supposed to look like Thor, baby. And it's messing with guys' minds in a big way too. Teens are hitting the weight room, adults are chugging supplements, just anything for that unattainable Adonis bod. So again, kudos to Billy for using her platform to address women's body issue struggles. That kind of awareness is important, but we really should start opening our eyes to the bigger picture. Maybe. Just maybe, body image isn't a gender thing. Last I checked, we're all humans under this skin, and these unrealistic beauty standards are doing a number on people of all shapes, sizes, and sexes. Like, if you fluctuated in body shape like me over the years, y you know exactly what I mean. The way people treated me when I was working out every day in college is so much different than the way people treated me when I was a chubster growing up. Even now, that I'm packing it back on, yeah, there's a blatant difference. I see you all. It's time for a little more understanding and a little less judgment on both sides of the gender aisle. I mean, ladies, don't lie and say you're not into the muscles, too. We've got enough wars to fight without turning looks into one. Our next discussion now turns to the complex interplay between personal faith and professional responsibilities, particularly in public schools. A recent incident involving a Georgia high school football coach conducting a baptism for players after practice raises important questions about this balance. Well, folks, we've got ourselves a tale of faith versus duty out in the gridiron. A high school football coach decided to channel his inner preacher and baptize players after practice. Now, baptisms can be a beautiful thing. A celebration of faith, community, and uh, decorative white robes. But when they happen on public school grounds, well, that's a penalty for illegally mixing church and state. Imagine you're a student on the team with a different faith or perhaps no faith. When your coach wraps a football in a religious veil, you may start to wonder, like, do I need to join this faith to get some game time and fit in? So this isn't just about the baptism. It's about the bigger message it sends. Public schools are a diverse place, a melting pot of different cultures and beliefs simmering together with one tasty educational stew. When a school official adds their own religious seasonings, it changes the flavor for everybody. And some students may get salty. Sure, you could argue it's the coach's personal expression, and he's just celebrating his faith with his willing players. Which, look, I get it, but like, there's also this separation of church and state thing us Americans are so keen on. Public schools have to play it neutral when it comes to religion. A coach spreading faith makes some students feel 
well out of bounds. At the end of the day, faith is a personal journey. But when you're a public figure, you've got to be careful not to lead others down a path they didn't ask for. Leave the preaching to the preachers and keep the public schools secular. At least that's my two cents. And like the law or something, but, but what do I know? A New York appellate judge has lifted a gag order against former President Donald Trump, previously imposed for comments about court staff during his fraud trial. All right, so buckle up, folks, because we've got some primetime courtroom drama on our hands. So Trump had found himself in front of a judge trying to put a muzzle on him. I mean, we're talking a big old gag order to stop these signature spitfire tweets of his. But now another judge came along and hit the pause button on the whole thing. So let's set the scene real quick. Trump's legal team has some beef with this one law clerk, Allison Greenfield. They're calling her biased, out of control, you know, that the whole nine yards. Basically accusing her of rigging the case like it was a carnival game. And yes, those games are rigged. So stop spending your money on them. Actually, I've got a better idea if you're going to spend your money on them, just go ahead and give it to me. You know, I'm not paid for this yet. You know, help a brother out. My voice got so high there. Moving on. Judge Arthur Engron slapped Trump with the, um, I don't even remember what I was saying. What was I saying? Uh, right. We were setting the scene. Something about Trump. Judge. Gotcha. Right. But then Judge Arthur Engron slapped Trump with not one, but two fines for breaking the gag order for running his mouth on social media. And it's seen straight out of reality TV. He dragged Trump onto the stand, grilled the man, and then hit him with a third fucking fine. You'd think people would learn their lesson. Here's the thing, though. I know the gag order was meant to keep things dignified and impartial, but trying to gag Trump is like trying to put a muzzle on a bullhorn. So thinking that it was going to stop him is some sort of, I don't know, foolish, dumb, it's fucking stupid is what it was. You thought it was going to stop him? Sorry, let's ponder this for a second, though. Imagine, if you will, you're part of this case in some way, shape, or form. I, I don't really care. Witness, clerk, attorney, whatever. Suddenly, Trump's tweeting to his millions of fans and followers that you're the villain of this legal soap opera. Would you feel safe? Should you feel safe? You shouldn't feel safe. I mean, there was that guy that just like attacked Paul Pelosi in their house. Like you don't want to be in these people's crosshairs. His tweets don't just hurt feelings. They can literally mess with the machinery of the justice system itself. Witnesses might backpedal. Jurors might feel pressured. Judges get questioned. I mean, it's like his voice will echo through the courtroom despite any gag order anyways. Sure, the guy has a right to free speech just like anyone else. But like there's a difference between speaking your mind and influencing a case that you're smack dab in the middle of. And with an audience like his, Trump's tweets carry consequences. Freedom of speech does not equal obstruction of justice. But until they can figure out what they're actually doing here, this case is probably going to get loud again. And they'll probably try and shut him up again. So, yeah. In our last story, we're exploring a riveting development that's captured the internet's attention. A 2002 letter by OBL to America has resurfaced and gone viral on social media, sparking a massive and fierce debate over its contents. This resurgence has brought to light various interpretations and misinterpretations of the letter, leading to significant discussions across social media platforms. It's a phenomenon that not only reflects the power of digital platforms in shaping public discourse, but also underscores the complexities involved in understanding historical documents in the modern age. All right, so if you didn't catch that analysis segment, um, there's going to be some substitutions. There's a lot of censorship going on for this one. And I, I really did want to talk about it, and I didn't want to get dinged. So, I mean, I'll try my best. Okay, so the heart of the matter is a letter written by OBL back from 2002, which has recently gained some attention on TikTok. I hope you understand who this letter is from. The letter, originally intended as justification for Al Quackduck's actions, including that of 911, has potentially been taken out of context in several viral videos, leading to what some view or believe to be a skewed perception perception of its content and intent. The letter itself addresses a range of topics, including criticisms of US foreign policies and OBL's views on Western influences within this country. Sorry guys, just treading real careful right now. Reportedly, the way the letter is being presented on social media is partial and often omits crucial content. A selective portrayal can contribute to a distorted understanding of the letter's message among viewers, particularly with those that may not be familiar with the full historical and geopolitical background. These debates raise important questions about the role of social media platforms in disseminating information. This whole thing sort of really highlights the need for critical thinking and comprehensive analysis when encountering historical documents or or any politically charged content online in other words people really need to start doing their own research isn't it a little mind-blowing how just one letter just like a piece of paper with words on it can turn the tide of public opinion on something as significant as 911 i mean we're talking about a letter that's two decades old suddenly popping up and causing a shitstorm. it's like finding an old vhs tape and realizing it's your parents sex tape it changes 
everything you thought you knew. OBL's letter isn't just this historical document anymore though, it's kind of become this catalyst for a massive shift in perspective for many. Its power isn't in the content, but in how it's being presented and interpreted. Little reminder that history isn't just about the past, it's alive and kicking, and can jump out of you when you least expect it. I mean, what do they say? Those who don't learn their history are doomed to repeat it? Anyways, what side of the fight are you on? Let me know what you think in the comments. If you're ballsy enough, I don't bet a single one of you are brave enough to say something. I dare you to. And on that note, we're gonna call it. If you like what you saw, help a guy out and hit that subscribe button. I mean, you made it this far into the video, so you saw something. And until next week, stay weird, stay safe, and I will see you on Monday. You know what? I should stop making you promises, but I'll see you on Monday.